So uh, hi everyone. So my name is Jason, and uh, today Kanak and I are going to talk about fine-grained scheduling with Helix. Uh, both Kanak and I are working at the LinkedIn Data inf Infrastructure Team, and we are both uh, Apache Helix commuters. So for those who don't know Helix yet, here is a few words about Helix. So Helix is a generic class manager. So it automates this assignment of partitioned, replicated, distributed tasks in the face of node failure, node recovery, uh, class expansion, and uh, reconfiguration of the clusters. So I want to share a, a story. So yesterday, Kanak and I went to this uh, solar cloud uh, talk. And basically, the solar talk is a distributed uh, solar service that deal with this failure and, and uh, elasticity of the clusters. So what we discovered is that they are almost using the identical design uh, as Helix. And even we can find a one-to-one -one mapping from the terminologies used in solar cloud to like Helix. But except that these this, this terminologies are tightly coupled to their, their applications. So in, instead, Helix is trying to abstract all these terminologies uh, for uh, distributed resources uh, to handling failure, to handling this class elasticity. So basically, for example, we allow user to plug in uh, arbitrary state machines. So for example, you can have a leader standby state model, but for, result, for database, you can have like a master slave state model, and for many other applications, you can come up with any kind of state machines you have. And also, we can let user to specify their placement strategies, so where this resource should be repli uh, uh, placed, and so on. So here is a simplified rough architecture of, of, the, of the data infrastructure used at LinkedIn. So Helix is pretty successful at LinkedIn. So here in the middle of this, this diagram, we see this DB. This is a data store. This is source of truth. And this comes user writes and reads. And beneath the DB, we see this uh, data change capture system. So it's captured the change of the database and feeds into the downstream applications. So we have these change consumers that consume changes from the database. And downstream applications may be a search index. So they build uh, this search index uh, with these data uh, changes. And also we have a data replicator that's replicating these changes to another data center. And on the left of this diagram, we have this ETL job that takes snapshots from the database and uh, transform to HDFS for analytics. So we can see that in the, for the DB, the Helix use, is using Helix to manage the, the, the database clusters. For this data change capture, we also use Helix to manage uh, the, 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 the data change clusters to, uh, to capture the changes. And on the data change consumer part, we also use Helix to do the, to do the load, uh, load balance among the, the, the consumers. And for search index, it also makes sense to use Helix to uh, manage the index shard and uh, to deal with fail, uh, failure, fail, failure and uh, class expansion. And data replicator also use Helix for fail, uh, failover, and ETL, ETL also use Helix. So pretty much uh, every like, distributed systems in this data infrastructure use Helix to do this class management. Uh, so here is a few numbers uh, in production about Helix. So over 1,000 instances covering like 330,000 uh, databases partitions managed by Helix, and over 1,000 instances for change capture uh, consumers. And for a single uh, uh, Helix cluster, we can handle as many as 500 instances. And all these numbers are uh, per data center. So Helix is extensively used inside LinkedIn, and we also got a few, a few external uses cases. So here we Instagram use Helix, Box, and, and GBoss. So uh, in, in a data center, we see a lot of diversities. So here, example, we have different types of jobs running in a data center. So we have, for example, this uh, database service. We have uh, two partitions, and each partition may run in uh, backup jobs that periodically uh, take backups. 
And also we may have ETL jobs that take snapshots and transfer the snapshots to SGFS. So we can see that there are different types of jobs. They're both long running services and they can be bad jobs running together in a data center. So here is a, a broader picture. So we have applications with diverse requirements running together in a data center. So we can have like online service, we can have uh, near line applications, we can have batch applications. Uh, they are distributed across the data center and on each physical node we can run in, uh, multiple types of uh, these jobs. And for example, the database is an online job and the batch is a near line job and this ETL are batch jobs. So how these processes are running each machines? So we can have each process running not natively on the physical machine. So the problem is there's no uh, resource isolation. So process will, will interfere with each other and they will compete for the resources. So another solution is to use virtual, virtual machines. So these virtual machines, we can create multiple ones on each physical machine and uh, let the process run in, on, in each uh, phys, uh, virtual machines. So this provides a strict isolation on the resources. So alternatively, we can have these containers running on, multiple containers running on the physical machine and running process inside these physical machines. So the containers compared to the virtual machines, they are more flexible, they are easy, they are more like lightweight here to start and stop. And also they provide isolations on resources like memory, uh, CPU, and disk storage. So as a summary, like we can run processes in, in individually. This tends to be either poor isolation or poor utilization. We can have virtual machines, they provide better isolation. Examples are Zen and Hyper 5, et cetera, and we can also use containers. So these containers use control groups provided by the kernel to do the uh, resource isolations. Examples are Young and uh, Mesos. So compared to virtual machines, these containers are super lightweight. They are more dynamic uh, based on the application requirements. So both virtualization and the container, container, containerization significantly improves the the process isolation and opens up possibilities for a better utilization of the physical resources. So let's see how the container based, uh, how container can solve to deploy and manage systems inside data center. So here are an example. So let's see we have three, three applications, A, B, C, and for application A, we require three containers running and each container requires 64 megabytes of memory. And for application B, we require two containers. Each of them requires 128 megabytes of memory. And for container C, we have, uh, for application C, we have one container requires 256 megabytes. So this is just a simple example that uses one dimension of the resources. But in reality, you can have multiple dimensions of resources when you're trying to specify the, uh, the application requirements. So once we come up with these re application requirements, we can uh, allocate these containers inside physical machines. So here is an example. We start all these containers and then we can start the process inside the containers. So containers is very powerful, but the problem is the process always fits so nicely into the, into the resources that, 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 that has been res reserved. So one problem may be overutilization. So first we al allocate a container with this much a memory, and gradually the process running inside this container, they use up all the memories and goes beyond the limit. So in this case, we need to uh, preempt and relaunch the container in somewhere else with a large allocation and start the process inside it. And in more common cases, this is underutilization because uh, the code base is complicated, the workload is dynamic, people don't people tend to overestimate the resources is the, the, applica the applications trying to use. So we can start process in containers, but there are some resources waste, waste in the containers. This over-provisioning will remain there until we started the container with a more appropriate estimation of the resources. To handle failures, so physical machines can go down. For example, in this case, we can have the second node goes down. So to handle failures, we need to start the application, or start the container somewhere, somewhere else in the healthy machines and restart the process. So this is cool, but what about stateful systems? 
So here we show that for application A, there may be some state associated with these containers or these this processes. So these three containers, one of them are running in master, master mode and two of them running in slave mode. So if the second node fails without additional information, the master will become unavailable until it, the container restarted somewhere else. To deal with scaling, so workload may grow and we need to add new machines to the cluster. So we need to allocate new containers and scale store workload. So here example, we add a new machine to the cluster. So in order to uh, scale the system, we need to repartition the workload. We shut down the containers and we locate three new containers. Each of them will take one third of the, the new sharding. So in a summary for the container-based solution, so in terms of the utilization, the application need to uh, specify the uh, resource requirement upfront. And also to deal with fault tolerance, we may mainly just start new containers in somewhere else. And to scaling, we need to repartition the workload and also uh, we need to bring up the new containers to holding the new, uh, new shards. And for service discovery, because we only know that where well, the containers are running, so we can detect the existence of the, of the container, but um, by default, nothing more than that. So the container model provides a flexibility within machines, but within each containers, the workload is more or less homogeneous and we, the containers doesn't know the types of the, of the applications running inside the applications, uh, in, inside the containers. And there's no concept of roles or states associated with these applications running inside the containers. So we need something like final grains. So essentially we need to, some design that use task as a unifying abstraction of the workload unit inside a data center. So let's look at this ABC again. So in this case, instead of specifying the, the real physical requirements for, uh, for application A, we just see that A should be completed in less than five hours. And for B, we see that uh, B sh should always have two containers running. And for C, we see that for each request, the response time should be less than 15 milliseconds. So instead of specifying these physical resources, we are trying to uh, specify the real requirements of the applications. So using the abstraction of a task, we can have multiple tasks running inside each containers, and these tasks can be of different types. So how to do with overutilization? So we have task one that uses up its resources and it tries to uh, go beyond the limit of the containers. So in this case, we can allocate a new container somewhere else with a large, larger, uh, uh, larger size and re relaunch the task inside there and shut down the original one. So in this way, uh, we can hide the, we can hide the overhead of the container restart. So how about underutilization? So again, we can consolidate uh, the tasks into one container and shut down the the, the, the other container. So in this case, we can optimize the container allocation based on the real usage of the application. To deal with stateful systems like this, for example, we have uh, three uh, tasks. Each of them has three containers running, one in leader mode, the other two in standby mode. So if some node goes down, we can let the leader, the, leader, the, the standby node assumes the leadership so this is more desirable for systems that cannot wait for uh, a new container to start. So, for, di so for, for discovery, since we have this state associated with these tasks, we can not only uh, discover it by the, by the existence of the container, but we can also uh, do the discovery on state. So we cannot learn, learn on, we, we learn where everything's running as well as what state each task is in. So how about scaling? So again, we have two containers running six tasks, and this task's workload is gross, and we want to add a new, uh, new node to this cluster to uh, rebalance the workload. So we can, new, we can start a new container in the new node and just move the, 
move the task over there. So here is a summary comparing this, this con container-based solution, task-based solution. So use the task as the as an abstraction, we can uh, distribute the task uh, as needed to a minimum set of containers. So this provides more flexible and dynamic way to uh, use containers. And to deal with uh, fault tolerance, the existing task assume a new state without while waiting for the new container to start. And for scaling, we don't need to uh, repartition the workload, we just to uh, move the tasks to the, across containers. And for discovery, since we know more about what, what tasks run inside each container. So we can do discovery not only on existence, but also on the state. So what's the benefit of task-based solution? So we can reuse containers, and also we can minimize the overhead of relaunch containers, and it provides a fine-grained scheduling. So we can compare tasks to containers in a similar way we compare a thread to processes. So task is will be the more appropriate level of abstraction. So we see that we need a more performance-centric approach to do the resource management, and working at task granularity is, is more powerful. So how Helix can help? So systems like Young and Mesos, they provide these containers, which brings flexibility inside each, virtual, inside each machines. And while Helix can bring these concepts of tasks, which brings more flexibility inside, in, in terms of resource allocation inside a container. So Kanak, we're going to continue the talk about task management with Helix. Okay. So as you might have noticed, uh, we haven't really spent that much time talking about Helix. Uh, we just talked about this hypothetical solution if we had this magical thing that could work with a task granularity. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've added to Helix to kind of support going in this direction. But before I do that, I'm going to talk about you know, things that an application generally always needs to be able to do. So the first thing is capacity planning. So we basically need to make sure that we have enough physical resources up and running so that it can handle our application. Next, we need to actually deploy and launch things on those physical resources. Once they're running, we need to make sure they stay available, so we need some concept of fault tolerance. And, as Jason alluded to, we also care about the states of these systems, uh, because we actually want the code to be doing something useful, and we care as external observers often what things are doing. So, let me just talk a little bit about Helix concepts first. Um, the unifying concept in Helix is called a resource, and this is not to be confused with a physical resource. This is more like a, just like a logical entity that you're distributing in your cluster. And we say the resource can be partitioned. And you know, for the purposes of this talk, you can think of a partition of resource sort of like what we've been calling a task the entire time. And in that sense, a resource is sort of a, a group of tasks. Um, all partitions can be replicated, and all replicas can have some state associated with them. So maybe you have a master-slave state model. Um, you'll see that for each partition, you have a master and maybe something else in a different state. And you might ask, how do we decide you know, what state things should be in? And it all comes down to this state model with constraints. So the state model defines the states that you have in your system, and the possible transitions you can have in it. And then you have the constraints, which say things like, at various scopes, you know, for a partition, there should only be exactly one replica that's master. Or at a node level, there should be no more than 10 partitions hosted on this node. And transition constraints are things like, oh, you know, we should only be doing this many transitions at this scope, because otherwise there's gonna be too much entropy in the cluster. So put simply, Helix is all about managing the state of tasks in the system. And the way that Helix does this is it takes these tasks and it, and it assigns them to what we call participants, which are roughly, you can think of them as containers that are running code that can accept these tasks. Um, and this mapping is computed by our controller, which is fault tolerant, distributed, et cetera. And then we have these things called spectators, which are kind of hard to see here, but um, they're basically able to see what this mapping is because it's, you know, this is kind of the service discovery side of it. 
So diving a little bit deeper into the controller, uh, here's what it's doing at a high level. Uh, it's taking those constraints and the live nodes in your system, and it's feeding them into what we call the rebalancer. And the rebalancer is responsible for coming up with some assignment of those tasks to nodes. And as I said, the constraints could be something like single master or no more than three tasks per instance, et cetera. So this rebalancer interface is pretty simple. It just takes a snapshot of the cluster, uh, some configuration, some constraints, and it comes up with a mapping. And we have a few default implementations and we allow you to plug in your own if they don't work for you. But you know, as you know, we've been bringing up all these new concepts related to task-based assignments and all that, uh, working with containers, and so we haven't really talked about any of that yet. So what else do we need? Uh, we need some way to allocate containers. We need some way to deploy services on those, on those containers. Uh, we need isolation. And we need some way of monitoring how our resources, how the physical resources in our cluster are being used. So the first thing we added to our controller was uh, something we call a target provider. And what this does is it, based on some strategy, it determines how many containers we should have running in our system. And this strategy could be fixed, which, which is to say we should always have K containers running in the system no matter what. Um, it could be like CPU, which says, uh, make sure you have enough containers running such that the usage is never this much CPU. Um, and then you can have some combination of that. So far we've only implemented fixed, but uh, we're working on integrating with monitoring systems so we can get enough information to do some of the other ones. And here's the interface, again, pretty simple. Uh, given a snapshot of the cluster and some constraints, just figure out how many containers to acquire, release, start, and stop. So going back to this picture, on, on kind of in a parallel track, we have the constraints and nodes feeding into this target provider. So what do we do with this target provider response? Well, that's the second thing that we've, uh, this concept that we've introduced into the controller. It's called a container provider. And this is where you think of like Yarn and Meso. So this is where we say, okay, so we have these requirements for things we need to start up in our cluster. Let's go to one of these uh, systems that's actually good at doing those things. And the interface is pretty simple. It's like you pass these in. Uh, basically, for each container that you want to change the state of, you, you pass it in calling one of these methods. So I also mentioned this uh, logical container provider, which is to say sometimes we have containers running in our system where we, you know, we're not using containerization or whatever. This, this concept is pretty general in the sense that it can take things that are running and maybe not even start something, but even like mark something as I should be using it. So in, this, in that sense, it's a, like a logical mapping. So back to this picture again, target provider feeds in the container provider, which actually affects the number of nodes in the system, which goes back into the rebalance or task assignment part of Helix. So it's kind of like you have these two parallel things that are affecting, affecting each other, and there's this food feedback loop that's constantly happening as your cluster changes. And we call the target provider plus the container provider our provisioner. So mapping this back to the application lifecycle, uh, you can think of the target provider as taking care of capacity planning, the container provider taking care of the provisioning part of it, and then the fault tolerance and state management, that's sort of what Helix was good at already, and it's only being enhanced by the provisioner. So at a high level, what kind of like how would we integrate with things like Yarn and Mesos to make this work? Um, so in general, we need some sort of resource provider, like a master, which is responsible for keeping track of all the resources in the system. So we assume that all the container providers have this. We're able to submit work to these resources, which starts up a container which runs our Helix controller. Now once this Helix controller is running up, running, uh, we can go back to this resource provider and start asking for containers for actual applications. And I should mention that this controller is uh, meant to be multi-tenant, so it should be able to manage multiple applications. So it starts up a container, which will be running our application code. And this will be running, you know, this will be able to accept whatever task that the Helios controller assigns to it. So if we look at Yarn by itself, it's actually, you can see a lot of overlap here. So you, we have an application master, which is started up when a, a, an application is submitted by a client. Um, 
And then that's kind of responsible for starting containers for its application. So if we add Helix to this, it, it maps pretty well. It's uh, in the application master, we're running the controller, and in the regular containers, we're, we're running the Helix participants, and those accept tests. And we also have you know, HDFS where we can pull our application packages from. Now going to Mesos, fundamentally it's actually not that different. The one big difference is that in Mesos, that you're kind of, uh, you have a scheduler that's negotiating offers with the master. So here it's like, you know, once an offer is sort of deemed to be fit for your application, then you're able to run an executor on your slave, uh, which will be able to run tasks within that. So if you add Helix here, we can say that the scheduler is sort of running in the Helix controller. And maybe this controller was started up using some you know, method of uh, scheduler failover fault tolerance. Uh, there's a few ways to do that. Um, and from then on, you know, the scheduler is one of the schedulers that it's talking to Mesos, and it can you know, negotiate the starting of a slave machine, which can start up executors, which can hold a few participants. So let me just give a, a brief example. Let's go back to what we started with at the beginning. Uh, we have a database which is holding a few partitions. Again, we say that a partition sort of maps to a task here. Um, and we say that for each partition, we should have exactly one master, and we should be roughly distributing our masters in some reasonable way. So there, there's no machine that has too many masters. Um, at the same time, we have these backup tasks which would be running for each partition on one of the machines that has a slave. And we have ETL, which is taking snapshots and pushing to HDFS. So if something goes down, uh, one of the slaves, in this case for partition one, gets promoted to master, and the, uh, the P0 backup moves to the other machine that, or container here that has uh, been hosting a slave for uh, P0. So showing how that maps to the yarn picture I showed a couple minutes ago, here we're just saying that uh, all the tests that we started up are, are living in this container uh, as, as the app abstraction. And these were assigned by the controller. Uh, we're still working on this part, but we're thinking we can specify this with uh, some sort of YAML. So here we say things like, you know, how do we get to our packages? Um, what, what kind of services are we actually planning to run? And then we have this thing called a service config map which is what you think of as the specification for our target provider. So here we could so, say things like, oh, we want to have three containers with some requirements, something you might see traditionally. Or if you've implemented the right target provider, you could even go a lot more fine-grained and say things like, oh, you know, the service should be taking no more than five hours to complete, so start up as many containers as you need to in order to honor that uh, request. So once you've started up your application, your container is going to start. And we have a few callback-based uh, um, interfaces that you can implement in order to you know, be able to do things when this happens. So from a container scope, we have this thing that's like we have initialization, and then we're told when we're going online or when we're going offline. So if you have any startup or cleanup you need to do, this is where you can do it. And then within the, for the tasks within the containers, we have our own callbacks. So for something like a backup task, it makes sense to have callbacks like this where it's, you know, it says when it's time to start, pause, resume, cancel, et cetera. But if your task is like a database partition, you actually want something a little bit more detailed. So in this case, we, we support, and this is something that um, we've been, we supported basically from the beginning with Helix, where for each state transition, we get a callback. Uh, so you know when you become a slave uh, from a master or you know, any other transition. So from your application perspective, you know how to get ready to handle that task. And just uh, a note on discovery. Uh, basically, we have these methods that can say, OK, for this partition or task, you know, I, wanna, I only want the masters because this is a database, and I want to send writes to the master. Or for, you know, if I'm doing a read and it's a database, maybe I don't care. I can send it to a slave. So then I just care about who's hosting this partition. So. As a, as a kind of overall uh, summary of this talk, it's, it's basically that you know, containerization has been huge for data center utilization, isolation, et cetera. And with Helix, we just want to take it a step further 
and make you know, fine-grained scheduling possible by really you know, focusing in on the tasks that are running inside containers. And with the target provider and container provider abstractions, uh, any popular provisioner can be plugged in. So we have a little bit of time, so I'm gonna try to do a quick demo. And this is what I would call uh, the hello world service. So this is sort of just like showing that we can dynamically change containers uh, based on our fixed requirements. We always say that K containers must be running. And if, if that number ever changes, like something fails, then you know, we'll automatically start up a new container. So let me find out, okay. So first thing I'm gonna do is start up yarn. Okay, now I'm gonna start up a Hello World service. Ah, oh, I gotta wait. Now if this works right, on the dock on the left, you're gonna see a bunch of random Java processes start up. And right now I'm just saying that uh, we should have exactly three containers running. And so we've started up, we, we've sent requests to start those three containers. Let's see if they, there they are. Okay, so now we have three containers running for our system. Now, we didn't make this clear, but Helix uses Zookeeper to maintain its state. So what I can do is connect to this local Zookeeper running the Helix controller. And I can see that we have three live instances running. And they're all online for this container. So um, I'm not gonna be running any tasks on this container, but I'm gonna show that we can vary these containers dynamically. Um, so, I'll use this tool to change the number of containers that should be running to two. And one just died, and so, now we see that uh, these two containers are available to serve this ser uh, service. And I can take it back to three. And now we have three again. So yeah, so basically what this shows is that we've, we've basically done most of the plumbing required in order to uh, work with this kind of task-based abstraction and let Helix control uh, something like Yarn in order to tell it that you know, more or fewer containers are necessary. Um, so our, kind of, our current progress is basically, we've got this plumbing done with Yarn, it's about a third of the way done with Mesos, and uh, we're working on some better APIs for actually being able to start you know, batch tasks. Because right now you can run, like Helix has traditionally been for more like long running things and uh, highly stateful services, so we're trying to make Helix kind of a little bit more flexible in that sense. So with that, uh, be happy to take any questions. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, yeah. So do you actually use Helix with both Yarn and Mesos at LinkedIn? Uh, currently, like at LinkedIn, we're, we're sort of in our offline data processing side, they're, they're moving towards Yarn, so we need to get this built before they actually did this integration, so we're just trying to be ready by the time they do that. That's, that's sort of where we're at at LinkedIn. With Mesos, I, I think Ben is actually gonna talk to some people over there, so right now we're not using Mesos at all in, in uh, LinkedIn.
Does it kind of make sense eventually for Helix to be folded into Yarn or folded into Mesos? Uh, possibly. I mean, it, it's sort of like, right now they're, they're solving more or less orthogonal problems. So mm. Helix is all about you know, making sure that things, like your system does something useful when things are running that can serve your system. And now we're just doing this integration so that Helix can give hints to these systems so that um, applications can have more, you know, richer, have richer requirements that we can actually act on. So that, that's sort of the motivation for all this. Um, in terms of which direction that should be, um, I think it's possibly reasonable that they could be integrated into them one day. But that's, that's something that I think requires some design work, and we'll see. Can you like uh, integrate Helix with uh, other, uh, um, let's say, management softwares? For example, Ambari from Hortonworks. Um, could you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Can you integrate uh, Helix with uh, other management software? For example, Ambari from Hortonworks, um, Apache I'm Ambari. I'm personally not familiar with uh, that particular system. Uh, at a high level, what does it do? Uh, they try to install and provision, install, manage uh, Hadoop clusters. Um, yeah, I think at, at some at some level there is some some things we could get out of that. So, um, for instance, okay, let's take a Cloudera manager. I mean, if you're familiar with that, uh, so can I integrate uh, Helix with the Cloudera manager? Vice versa. I mean, fundamentally, if you can implement these four functions using your system, then we can integrate Helix with it. OK, um, so that's a Java interface. Yeah, I mean, right now, Helix is more or less uh, JVM specific. So okay. I think we have some bindings in Clojure um, that are more or less experimental. Uh, but it's, it's, yeah, Helix right now is mostly Java. Uh, we have some client-side Python support. Um, but yeah, right now we're, we're calling for people if they're interested to write new uh, language bindings. Okay, uh, one last question. Um, one last question. So I, I think I saw a slide where you displayed all the available containers. Uh, oh, am I correct? Did I see, see properly? Do, do you have a tool to see all the containers? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Do, do you have a tool to see all the containers uh, which uh, you're managing, stuff like that? Now, uh, Helix doesn't really have a dashboard, so we're, we're kind of stuck using Zoo Inspector, which is a Zookeeper tool. And since Helix uses Zookeeper to manage its state, uh, we can piggyback off of that. So we have this thing called an external view. And so for our service, we can see exactly which containers are available for that service. OK. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so I saw that uh, you have some sort of uh, moving one task from one container to another container. Uh, so is it the task is completely relaunched from scratch? Or? So uh, we kind of hid what that's actually doing. Uh, generally speaking, what we're doing is we're, when, we, when we think it's time to move something, we actually start a new task in the container and you know, start bootstrapping it from, and start bootstrapping it. And when we feel it's sufficiently bootstrapped, then we can shut down the other one and then transition that one to the primary. So because we have these state transitions at our disposal, we can kind of hide that overhead for starting new tasks in containers or starting new containers. All right. Thank you. Thanks.